Yeah, good morning, October 5th, uh, 2021. I'm Jay Fidel. This is ThinkTech. And the show we're doing this morning is ThinkTech Tech Talks. We're going to talk about technology, more specifically new entrepreneurial inventions, innovations, right here in Hawaii with our guests, uh, Stephen Businger um, and Paul Sin. Uh, Stephen is the chair of the Medi Meteorology Department at UH Manoa. This part of Seoul West, I guess. Um, and Paul is an inventor. We love inventors, all kinds of inventors. We should all be inventors. And he's an entrepreneur, tries to commercialize his inventions. What a way to spend your life. I wish I could do that. Good morning, Stephen. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, Good morning, Jay. So let's, we have three things to talk about and I'll tell everybody in advance what we're gonna talk about. Um, let's see, one is um, we're gonna talk about this innovative plan um, I guess that's by Paul, but also Stephen, to clean up the Alawai Canal and make Mike Waikiki more resilient. And we're going to talk about the Rainbow Chase smartphone app, which uh, it's a weather app that uh, gives you guidance on where to find your rainbow. Wow, that's I've always waited for that, you know. Uh, and you got to get there quick, I think. And then also uh, we're talking about Stephen's app, the Stephen's modeling page, where he models eruptions in Kilauea and then tells you uh, what you can expect for VOG. Oh, very interesting. SOAST is really cooking, Stephen, don't you think? Absolutely, yeah. SOAST is on, on fire, so to speak. Kilauea <laughs> is certainly on fire. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the first one. Um, Paul, can you talk about you know the uh, your innovative plan to clean up the alloy? Yeah, when I heard the news about um, uh, um, the mayor, the Rikunjari, said um, he's looking for a new idea from community about the Alawai Canal flood control system. I fired up myself and uh, I bring up the new idea. I think uh, my idea is not too bad. What is your idea? Can you can you tell us? Yes. Um, number one idea is about not touching uh, Kapiolani side park outlet. We just put the berm to guide overflowing water to Kapahulu side. That's part number one. Number two is we put second outlet to Kapiolani side park and we put, put the two gates. Kapaholo side will be open when the low tide become high tide and the harbor side it flows. But when the tide come in, all the water goes through canal from Kapaholo side. End of the high tide, we close harbor side gate. And all the water go out to our side, which means two times a day we flush the Alawai canal. We may can have a blue canal and a swim and fishing. And also we can control the flood. And uh, I think it's much, much cheaper and um, environmental friendly. We don't Steven, touch much. Stephen, you had something on this. Oh, I, I was just trying to say that uh, Paul made this fantastic model, which shows how this all works. And we have a video of it. So if uh, if it might be possible to stage that video, I think that would be the very best way to see how this works. Alawai flood control video. Global warming is reducing the return time of extreme floods in Hawaii. Therefore, now is a critical time to reimagine the Alawai Canal as an extreme flood control system. At the same time, the Alawai needs to be redesigned to control the pollution that comes with extreme floods. Part one, flood control through dry canal. To prevent Waikiki from being inundated by floodwaters, the dry canal system provides an outlet for floodwaters during extreme flood events. 
Kapiolani Park side of the canal only becomes active as a drain system when floodwaters are about to overflow Waikiki. Part 2. Pollution control by tidal flow in a two-outlet system. During rising tides, the Kapiolani gate is open and the harbor gate is closed, allowing clean ocean water into the canal. During ebbing tides, Kapiolani gate is closed and harbor gate is open, allowing water to flow to the ocean on the harbor side. In summary, the dual outlet system controls water flow for flooding and pollution. Right. Well, that's great. So, Stephen, what would you add to that, you know, from uh, your point of view? Well, you know, climate change is giving us problems with flooding. It, our our uh, return time for very, very heavy rainfall events is becoming shorter. And so what used to be a 10,000-year event is becoming a 1,000-year event. And the 1,000-year event is becoming a 10-year event. And we have to prepare for these very large floods, the kind that, that hit Kauai in 2018 and uh, dumped 50 inches of rainfall in 24 hours and absolutely inundated the entire town of Haleiwa. Uh, no, sorry, uh, Hanalei. Mm -hmm. uh, Hanalei was washed away. Uh, so this is what will happen to Waikiki if we don't uh, use our imagination. And, and that's exactly what Paul Sin has done here is say, okay, how can we solve this problem in an economical way? And at the same time, the advantage is that you clean up the Alawai Canal because you have this ability during uh, 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 incoming tide, you, you open the, the gate on the Waikiki side and during um, um, outflowing tide, you open the harbor gate and close the Waikiki side gate. And this cleans the Alawai Canal. So it's, uh, I think it's a, a solution that is definitely worth consideration. Well, uh, uh, Steve, uh, what about, what about um, you know, uh, the, the possible negatives? That is that you don't have the same outflow from the mountains. In other words, is this going to be able to catch and release the water that comes in from the mountains, even in a bad rainstorm? Well. It, it, it's difficult to catch a flood. So what you really want to do is provide a path for this heavy, big flood to come down and escape to the ocean. And by having two uh, exits for the Alawai Canal, it allows you to prevent Waikiki from being inundated by, uh, by these floodwaters. What about the paddlers who come into the canal from, from the ocean or go out from the, the ocean to the uh, out, out from the, um, the canal to the ocean, they're going to be able to get through? Uh, absolutely. Uh, they're, they're, they'll be able to paddle through one way or the other, and they'll be very happy because the water will be blue and clean instead of murky and as it is now, uh, a, bit, a bit problematic with pollution. What about the uh, issue that Mufi Henneman with the, sewer, the sewerage system um, in uh, Waikiki, in the island of Waikiki, so to speak, um, where you know the, the the water level got so to the point where the sewage system was not functional, you had to dump sewage. What what what, what does this affect any of that? Well, I I think that, that that's a big problem, and I don't think it's been resolved. And when you do have floods, the uh, the problem is that the sewer system gets. Uh, overtaken uh, because we use uh, the same, you know, the sewer and the floodwaters kind of come through the same uh, pipes, if you will. Um, and uh, they can be separated to some extent and you take, the, of course, the pollution, the sewer uh, through the treatment plant. But when there's so much water and it's coming in together, then you, you have a problem and that results in a release of, uh, of pollution into the ocean. Um, but, the, but the best thing is that this allows at least the Alawai Canal system to clean itself out after those events, mm. which it currently can't do. Mm. Um, yeah, one other thing is, so what, what are these, it's, it's, it's a great idea to have, a, it's effectively a valve, you know, but what, what are the, um, the, the components made of it? 
Concrete, steel, a combination? I'll let Paul take that one. Hey, Paul, what are the, you know, what are the components, you know, the, the valve components, so to speak, uh, on this system? What are they made of? You mean the valve? Yeah, well, the, the thing that holds the water back or, or allows it to pass. I think they can use uh, all kinds of technology to have a gate. You know, I'm only an idea man. <laughs> they have a <laughs> great um, uh, technology to can take them, they can make a better uh, gate system. Okay, but the gate has to turn, right? And there has to be some kind of um, motor, or some kind of um, some kind of energy exerted on opening and closing it, right? Yeah, of course, yeah. But it's that's only minor kind, you know, instead of uh, all kind of pumping system. <laughs> well, you, you know why this is so remarkable? Because when uh, Hawaiian dredging was first established, was uh, 1910 or 11, um, its first project was the Alawai. And the first plan they had for the Alawai was to allow free flow of water not only from the Alawai into, uh, you know, into the Waikiki channel there, Papialani, um, but um, also to allow it to flow freely on Kapahulu. And the original plan was to dredge Kapahulu Avenue. That wasn't exactly. supposed to be Kapahulu Avenue, supposed to be a, a second channel. They yeah, right. They flow around the whole island, but they ran out of money. And exactly. politically, there was no political will to finish it. So that's why we have a problem there. This seems to solve that very problem. A uh, two gate uh, outlet is, uh, I think, um, a very important idea because of uh, even there's a um, decent amount of uh, rainfall, uh, Kapaulu side, the beach ain't gonna be brown with the two uh, gate outlet system. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I was just thinking, uh, you guys must know, uh, he died a few years ago, but uh, Alfred Yee, um, and he, he, uh, he was with the engineering department and with SOWEST also. And he, um, he was into concrete, concrete structures. And he and Hans, uh, Hans his, his, his co-partner, um, developed a, a set of uh, these special concrete forms that they wanted to deploy at the uh, natatorium. Um, and um, it was a, there was a selection process in the city and the city couldn't make up its mind and it never got started, but it seemed to me a really good idea. So before we leave the subject, I wanna tell you there, you tell me, is there an engineering possibility of using a concrete form specially designed that would act as a valve without requiring the energy to move it back and forth? Stephen? I think that's definitely a, an idea worth uh, considering. Yeah. yeah, you do want to be able to prevent the, the flow of water uh, in a incremental basis, but I, I think that as far as the design of the gate is concerned, uh, it's open for innovation too. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, that's a great idea. Really wonderful idea, and it touches Hawaii history. It certainly touches the history of Waikiki. Um, it touches uh, it touches tourism, if you will. It'd be very interesting to have this as an additional feature for uh, for Waikiki and therefore the engine of our economy. Uh, it should be well accepted. I hope you can take some dramatic steps and get it approved. Thank you. Well, we're we're working in that direction, and and uh, we are in in touch with the um, Corps of Engineers. So we'll see we'll see what they think. Okay, let's go to the next one. Let's go to rainbows. This is yours, but you're both working on this. This is yours, Paul, but you're both working on this. How in the world can you identify a rainbow technologically? Well, let, let Actually, me say, well, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Paul. Go ahead, go ahead, just, Stephen. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's all geometry. When the sun is behind you, the rainbow is at 42 degrees from the head of your shadow. So you have to look at the at your shadow and then look up and that's where the rainbow will be. Now, if you have a weather app that uh, uh, has radar data 
and it has the sun angle, it can predict when and where you're going to see a rainbow. And if you make that uh, available on a smartphone that knows where you are, then it becomes a very powerful but uh, user-friendly guide to tell you when to look up, see rainbows. What is it? What is the? Uh, what, what sensors are working out of the smartphone to pick this up? Oh, it is. It's really a complicated. Uh, uh, app because it takes all of the National Weather Service radar data, and there's 160 radars in the whole country. And, and we're expanding, by the way. We've got all the West Coast now, but, and, and we have all of Hawaii. So uh, basically, you have all that radar data. We also import satellite data and even model data. And all these data are utilized in the app, and it's a full blown weather app. Uh, but the fun thing about it is that you can see when. Uh, uh, rainbows are possible, uh, and and in the app. So that's you, that's its you claim to it, fame. You see the rainbows before they appear. I mean, does it give you warning the rainbow is coming, or does it tell you when they are appearing? Oh, you know that's an excellent question. And and at the moment we don't give warnings, but that is in our to do list. Uh, at the moment, you have to go to the app and look. But you know, I think that works pretty well too, because you know when it is that you have a little time, and if you want to go chase a rainbow, you have that, that opportunity uh, using the app. Okay, so um, it's, it's just, this would this is you know there's a thing called climate, uh, and climate is an app for your cell phone, your Android, what have you, your app, your Apple, um, and you know climate will tell you. Uh, I guess it gathers data from the weather service. Um, and it'll tell you if there's a storm heading your way, what the weather's going to be like, whether you should, you know, be going going to a safe place, what have you. Thirty bucks a month. Yeah. I, I looked at it, and then it was a complete turnoff. Thirty bucks a month. Um, you know, for a fraction of that, I would be interested. So the question is, can you produce this? Can you commercialize the Rainbow app for cheap? Because if you can. You know, I think it can be bundled and tourists will just love it. Everybody will love it. They'll want to know, want to catch a rainbow. Nobody can ever catch a rainbow. It's always so elusive. And the next time you look, it's gone. What about a, a, an app on your phone that would be a reasonable price? Have you thought about how to do that? Well, that, that's what this is. And, and I have to say, Paul is incredibly generous because he is bankrolling the development of the app. Uh, and at the moment, we don't don't charge anything for it, so it's free, free to the public. And okay. you just have to go to Rainbow Chase in the App Store or uh, the Google Play Store, or you can go to RainbowChase.com, uh, which is our website, and you can down it, uh, download it there, both for the Apple side and for the uh, Android side. So it's available on both platforms. That's fabulous. That's really a contribution, again, to you know a, a distinct. Um... I call it a marketplace uh, of people who would like to see that, like to have that. And free is a tremendous benefit. It's a gift to the community, the whole community. Thank you very much, you guys, for that one. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, the next one uh, sounds like this is yours, Stephen. And this is about VOG, and it's about uh, getting data on Kilauea eruptions and being able to tell anyone who wants, on, I guess, on your phone also. Um, sure. you know, what the what the VOG is going to be. Can you talk about how that how that works? Sure. Uh, first of all, uh, if you have your pencil handy, you can write weather.hawaii.edu. That's the website. It's pretty easy to remember. Weather.hawaii.edu. And uh, if you look at there, you'll see uh, the VOG map, and that's what comes up if you click on it. And uh, Basically, it's it's a complex uh, uh, system where you take the weather data and you introduce it into a model which does uh, which which controls how the VOG moves. It's called a dispersion model, and then you um, and, and then you need to have. Uh, uh, emissions from the volcano, which we get from the Hawaii Volcano Observatory. So this is a, a collaborative effort with uh, the USGS. So they gave us, gave us how much pollution is coming out of the vent, 
And then we put that into the dispersion model and we forecast what is the probability that the bloom is gonna be over you and that the concentration is gonna exceed a certain uh, threshold. And this will allow people to see if, uh, if VOG is gonna be an issue for them. And there's a lot of people who are uh, allergic to VOG and are particularly sensitive to it. So it's a, it's a great opportunity for them to be able to get some guidance. Well, I think, um, you know, we're interested in uh, elderly people who have immune, you know, immune issues. And, um, you know, I, I know that this and fog affects them. They can't breathe so well. And uh, this is going to exacerbate their, you know, breathing issues. So this is really important for them. Um, query, though, um, do we have fog all the time, Stephen? I mean, is the, is the volcano always emitting some kind of, uh, you know, fog? Or does it only happen when we have an eruption? Oh, that's an excellent question. You know, it does get into this quiet mode. We were in a very quiet mode after the big eruption in 2018. Um, and then it erupted a little bit in January of, uh, of this year, and then went quiet again. And, it, and the emissions got so small, there was still some emission, but it got so small that bog was really not an issue. Now, however, in the last couple of weeks, uh, there's been a large eruption. The first day there was 85 tons per day emitted, which is a huge number, real problematic number. And then it has settled down. I think it's around 10,000 tons per day at the moment. So that's a, a little bit better. Uh, over the period from 1983 until now, it has been erupting most of the time. We've just had a very short break in the last, uh, since you know, August of 2018, there's been some breaks, uh, but it's been continuously erupting most of that time. And, and it, uh, it started erupting again, uh, you know, a week ago. And, and uh, who knows how long it'll continue to be active in its active phase. But in its active phase, then it will be, uh, putting out enough VOG that we need to really pay attention to where it's going. If we have some southeasterly winds that blow the VOG from the Big Island to uh, Oahu, uh, you'll see our emergency rooms full of people who are allergic to VOG. Oh, how interesting. Yeah. Well, what's, what's the chemical uh, you know, makeup of it that, that uh, uh, activates their uh, allergies? Uh, good question. Sulfur dioxide is the gas that is emitted. And sulfur dioxide itself is, is pretty um, caustic. It's not a happy gas to have to be breathing. Uh, but the, the gas also converts to aerosols and, it, and in cloud, it can produce sulfuric acid. So you can imagine breathing in sulfuric acid is just not a happy situation for your lungs. Uh, and these these aerosols, the sulfate aerosols uh, that result also downwind, are are very very uh, caustic and cause sore throats and scratchy eyes and give people problems depending on their you know uh, sensitivity and the, the the health of their the respiratory system as well. No emergency rooms would be uh, advised to, to to get this to, to download it. Um, to have it available because they can then predict what kind of traffic they're going to have. Um, the same thing yeah. with uh, you know pulmonary doctors who treat diseases of the lungs and breathing. Uh, they would be well advised to have a copy handy because then they can see whether this is a factor in you know the problem that a, a patient uh, presents to them. But one thing that strikes me, Stephen, is usually I associate VOG with Kona winds. Um, if the winds right. are not Kona, if you have regular trades, how much of an issue? What is, how does that change things? Well, uh, living on Oahu, we're lucky. With trade winds, we uh, avoid seeing the VOG. However, the Big Island has a problem because the trades take the VOG down past South Point, at which point the sea breeze pulls it back into Kona on the Kona side of the Big Island. So people from Pahala, and ocean acres and around the corner all the way to uh, Kona are affected by VOG when we have trade wind conditions. So it's a, it's a considerable issue for the Big Island in particular. 
Well, I think it'd be valuable for people to be able to see. They'll they'll be able to see on your app what direction the fog is going. Right? You get that cloud. Can we yeah. look at that cloud for one minute yeah. more? <clears throat> you get that cloud. You get a, a, the size of the cloud reflects how much fog there is. You get the direction of the wind. I mean, carrying the fog. So uh, anyone in, in 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 that map would be able to. Uh, uh, make make a prediction as to when the VOG is coming for, for us, yes? Exactly, yeah. And the, the model runs about, about 60 hours, so it gives you two full days of uh, notice of what the VOG is predicted to do. Very valuable, very interesting, very, very creative, I must say. And I think there's a market for that one, too. <clears throat> well, you guys, you guys are great. Yeah. I tell you, I'm really impressed with uh, what you're doing. I'm impressed with the the way you do it. Uh, Stephen, I want to say that we're probably going to, you you as a meteor, meteorologist can tell me a lot quicker, but uh, we're probably going to have extreme weather due to climate change uh, affecting everywhere in the world. It's going to affect the weather here in Hawaii. And <clears throat> I would like to have you back <clears throat> to discuss how that would unfold, how extreme weather in Hawaii uh, may be hard to do, but you'd be in a much better spot than anyone else. Um, to, to tell us what it would be like, what the winds would be like, and what the direction of the winds would be like, the, what the rain would be like, and so forth. Uh, I hope you can come back and give us a handle on that, because I think we should all be informed in anticipation of the possibility, don't you think? Well, I think we should all be concerned about climate change, and, and we should uh, vote with our, uh, you know, our convictions. And... Uh, and also use that to make our own personal decisions, like uh, riding a bicycle or um, uh, buying an electric car, etc. Uh, but Jay, I would I would be uh, delighted to come back on and talk about climate change. And in the meantime, we can all uh, enjoy rainbows in Hawaii. We're we're coming into the winter season when there's more showers, and and Paul and I are are continuing to improve the app. Rainbow Chase, uh, check it out. It's uh, it's really fun. There's a lot of information at the website rainbow, uh, rainbowchase.com, and and again, it's it's Paul's ingenuity and his generosity that is making Rainbow Chase available for free at no cost. And it is a wonderful app. It gives satellite data, radar data. It tells you you know what the weather's going to be over the next couple of days. It's a it's a fun and uh, Affordable. Uh, Affordable yeah. indeed. I, I, right after yeah. the show, I'm going to uh, download it and take a look. I want to see what's happening in my neighborhood. And Paul, yeah. uh, you know, I'd like you to come back too, Paul, because you're obviously the guy, you know, who uh, is thinking 24 hours a day and these ideas pop into your brain at two o'clock in the morning. I know how that works. The magic of creativity. Um, and I hope you can, um, you know, commercialize at least some of them, not Rainbow Chase, but some of the others anyway. Um, and I hope you can come back and tell us about ideas that you that you will have going forward. You know, never stop, Paul. We need you, Paul. Jay. Jay. Yes. I promise you, I will be I will be back with a bigger idea pretty soon, within a few months. I have already planned everything already. You will be uh, delighted and love it. I know I will. <laughs> Paul Sin, uh -huh. entrepreneur and innovator and uh, and uh, inventor, uh, Stephen yes. Bussinger of, of SOWEST and the uh, meteorology chair there. And I really appreciate having you guys together. But I also want to say it's great to see you collaborating. Collaboration is the heart of creativity and science. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you very Aloha. much for